Well, we are in the book of Revelation. If you want to go ahead and turn there. You know, these uh, last Sunday of the month, we've been taking it and we've called it the Response Sunday. And on these Sundays, we've been taking time to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice and and we take a little, our through the Bible scripture that we've been going through. So we've been going through the book of Revelation and we take a portion of that and we zoom in and we look to Jesus and, you know, then we respond by taking communion together. That's what these, um, you know, these chrome trays are up here and around. And then we respond with worshiping together. And then on these summer months, we've been responding with baptism. So really looking forward to today. We have a handful of people that are going to be baptized. We get to hear some testimony, and it should be really sweet. But as we're looking at the book of Revelation, this book points us to Jesus all the way. In fact, we're going to be in chapter 4 and 5, but look with me, if you would, in Revelation chapter 1. So if you've got a Bible... I'm using the New American Standard Version, probably easiest to follow along if you're using a Bible app. There should be Bibles in front of you under the chair racks there. But Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, starts off, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. When we looked at this in the beginning of our study in the book of Revelation, you know, we saw in the original language that Revelation is apocalypsis. And this is where we get our word apocalypse. And people often think about apocalypse as, you know, some catastrophe or a, an end time scenario. And, but the, the word literally means an uncovering. It has the idea of an unveiling. It has the idea to, to pull back the curtain and to show what's behind the curtain. And this book, as we're looking at the book of Revelation, it is the unveiling of the resurrected Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of his power and his authority. And yes, Revelation is about end time stuff. And we're going to learn lots about that. You know, as we go through the study of Revelation, we're going to see things about the Antichrist. We're going to learn about the Great Tribulation. We're going to learn about the Millennial Reign. We're going to see the, the physical second coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to learn about the new heavens and the new earth. But first and foremost, most importantly, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if we miss that, we miss the book of Revelation. And it's the resurrected Jesus that gives this message to John to write down and share. And he said, you're blessed if you read and you hear this. Verse 3, it said that in chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is you read and hears these things. He says, and heed the things written in it, for time is near. He said, so as you pay attention, that's the idea to read and to heed, to pay attention, to know this, to keep this word, it's going to bring you joy. That's the idea of blessed. That's the idea what it means. It means a, a sustained, fulfilled type of joy. It's not just happy, but it, it is a, a satisfied joy. And he says here that the time is near for things to soon take place. And if you're like me, you're wondering, gee, Lord, it's been about 2,000 years since you wrote this. It feels a little bit more far off and a long ways away than soon and near. Peter writes something about that I, I think is helpful. And this is in 2 Peter 3. I have this for the overhead. 2 Peter 3, 8. He says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that 
With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And if you've been around here, you have heard me say this before. You know, if, it, if for the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, then for God, it's only been two days. For us, it feels like a long time. The original Greek word for this word near or soon is the word tachos. And it, and it means swift speed. We get our word tachometer. If you have a tachometer in your car, you kind of understand what's going on. It's telling you the, the revolutions per minute of your engine. And often the little tachometer's got a little red line in there somewhere. And if that tachometer gets to that red line, there's catastrophe, right? There's engine failure. So he says here, take heed, pay attention to these things because the needle is rising. So it has less of the idea to do of proximity and more has the idea of speed. And so he writes, things are rising. The needle is rising. Things are coming soon. They are near. And when the things of this book start happening, it's going to go quickly. And this is what we see in our world today. We see that the needle is rising. The Lord tells us we don't know the day or the hour, but there are signs of the times. And this is the world that we live in. We see signs of the times. And so the word here would be to, as Peter said, he, God is patient because he is wanting all to come to repentance and to come to know him. And so Jesus gives this message to John. He says, this, John writes this down. Boy, you're going to be blessed if you read and you heed these words because things are happening soon. And Jesus tells John to write to the church. Actually, chapter 1, verse 19. Look at it there. He tells them, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things that will take place after these things. If you've been around, you understand this is the, the approach that we are taking to our study in the book of Revelation. This is our outline. The things which you have seen, that's chapter 1, the resurrected unveiling of Jesus Christ. The things which are, that's chapters 2 and 3, those seven letters to the seven different churches. The things that will take place after these things, that's Revelation chapter 4 to the end, Revelation 22. And this is where we are, actually. Turn back over to Revelation chapter 4. We are in this scene in heaven. Really, we're in the throne room. And this is my hope and my goal for the day is to get you to that throne room. And as we respond and worship at the end of this message, I'm hoping that we just enter in. Remember the four living creatures, if you're with us in chapter four? He says in, in chapter four, verse eight, these four living creatures, each one of them having six wings or full of eyes around within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever, and they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. This was the scene in heaven where these living creatures were giving glory to God, and they were like the worship leaders. When they declared that God was worthy, that God was need, deserved glory, it was the elders that were in the scene of heaven there that we saw, that they fell down and they began to worship. 
And they worshiped God who is holy, God who is almighty, it says here, who was and is and is to come, the God who is the only God to receive glory, who is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And as we looked at this, we saw that it was creation was God's will. Did you catch that in the middle of verse 11? You created all things and exist, and because of your will, they existed and were created. We looked at that, we spent some time on that, and we talked about this idea that we can know our creator by what he has created. And so as Romans 1 talks about creation, points us to the creator. And so their attention is to the creator. And then John gives his attention to this book in the hand of the one who on the throne. This is chapter five, verse one. He writes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. Our last time together, we looked at this idea and we talked about how this book was significant. And, and I think it's important for us to understand that it's not a, a book as we might think of it as a, you know, a bound book, maybe like our Bible, but we're talking about a scroll. There's this rolled up scroll that was, had these seven different seals on it. And so the, the way that this scroll was in the hand of the one who was sitting on the throne and because of the writing on the scroll and because of the seals on the scroll, this told us that this scroll was important and it was significant. And we talked about some various things of what it might be. And, and we landed this idea that this could be the title deed to the earth, that Jesus was coming to reclaim. So it'd be his kingdom on earth as it is on heaven. And the breaking of these seven seals, we're going to see in the weeks ahead, will usher in the great tribulation which will then lead to the physical second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, his kingdom will be on earth. And he will rule and he will reign and he will make all things right. And joy will abound. But see, there's a moment, though, of sadness. Because there's this line here that we read in verse 2 that no one was able to open it look at it look at verse 2 chapter 5 verse 2 i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and break its seals and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it and then he says verse 4 i began to weep greatly because no one was able who was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. I want to talk about this for a minute because this is something that I think that is relatable. If you can imagine, if we know that, okay, the breaking of these seals, we got the scroll, we're going to open it, we're going to break these seals, we're going to open the scroll. This is going to usher in God's kingdom and everything's going to be made right and, and you're like, yes, we need that. Because in this world, people are calling what is wrong, right, and what is right, wrong. And we needed God to make things right. And so here it is. If we just open up this scroll, if we just break these seals, it's going to, Jesus is going to come and he's going to make things right. But then for John, there's no one able to open the scroll. He's lost hope. He begins to weep. It was a moment, in this moment, that things seemed hopeless. I mean, you have a statement made that no one under the earth, no one, what, what does it say here? It says, no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth was able to open the book. I think they covered the whole area. No one is able to open this. And then John's like, when is Jesus going to come back then? If no one can open this thing, how can he ever come back and make things right? I think you know what this is like. I think you know what this is like. Everyone here has had, has been in, 
has experienced that time, that moment, where things were hopeless, seemed hopeless, or things were dark, and you weren't sure how you were going to get to the light. Maybe you're in that season right now. You know, a lot of people in the room, there's a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different histories, a lot of different lives happening. And there's things in this room that people don't know about. And you could be in that scenario right now where it feels hopeless. It feels like no one is able to deliver me from this darkness. And in those seasons, in those times, you know how it is. You begin to question, does God really care? Maybe you read the Bible and you, you hear other people and they, the Bible says, you know, or you hear some preacher, maybe a short little video, oh, the Bible cares, the Bible, you know, God knows all and God cares. But then you're looking at your own situation and you're kind of digging in and you're thinking, does he? Because this is really hard and this is really dark. I think this is where John's at. I mean, there he is. He's in the throne room. God is on the throne, but he's got this thing that's going to usher in Jesus, and it seems that no one can open it. But then look at verse 5. One of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So what changed for John? Jesus. What changed for John? Looking at Jesus. John looked and he saw Jesus, the one who has overcome sin and death. Jesus, the lamb that was slain for your sin and my sin. Jesus, who was full of knowledge and wisdom and power. Did you see that in verse 6? The lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God. Throughout Scripture, his eyes suggest knowledge and wisdom. Jesus is full of knowledge and wisdom. He knows all. Horns suggest power. The lamb has knowledge and wisdom and power, and he's, he fulfills these things perfectly. He's full of the seven spirits. We've spent quite a bit of time in this, actually. It keeps coming up. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 talks about these seven different spirits that are resting upon God. It was the spirit of the Lord. It was the spirit of wisdom and understanding. It was the spirit of counsel and strength. It was the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord rested upon Jesus. And John looked to Jesus who was worthy it says, worthy, verse 9, are you to take the book and to break its seals. You were slain, and you purchased, these are past tense, you were slain, you purchased for God by your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. Verse 10, because of Jesus, you have been made a kingdom of priests. Jesus is the one with the power to release you from your sins. In fact, we have, uh, look back at chapter 1. Chapter 1, 
chapter 1, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the one that has the power. Jesus is the one that releases from you from your sins. It's by the blood of Jesus, the blood that he shed on the cross, that you become a kingdom of priests. You go from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light. He takes you from rags to royalty. And through his blood, you become part of his family. I love this idea, actually. I have this overhead. 1 Peter chapter 2, thinking about 1 Peter 2, 5. This idea of becoming a kingdom of priests. He says, 1 Peter 2, 5, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. I love this. Look at this. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Jesus doesn't disappoint. One amen. You guys, wake up. Jesus doesn't disappoint. Come on. Through Jesus, you're being built up with the purpose. There, Peter identifies his purpose of offering up spiritual sacrifices to God. He goes on, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Absolutely the overhead, yeah. First Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Once you were nobody, but now you're somebody. Once you had no mercy, but now because of Jesus, you're surrounded by mercy. Remember when we looked at that scene in the, in the throne that surrounded the, the throne of God? It was surrounded by mercy. Once you were poor, but now through Jesus Christ, you have been made rich in his grace. And what's your response? What's your purpose? To proclaim, Peter says, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look what happens here in Revelation chapter 5 when Jesus steps up to take the scroll. So there he is. He, he takes the scroll. They start proclaiming that he is worthy. And why is he worthy? Because he was slain. That means he, that was past tense. He is alive now. He purchased by his blood. And then it says here in verse 11, Revelation 5, 11, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the numbers of them were myriads upon myriads, and thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessings and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. What a scene. That's the throne room. That's what happens when you look to Jesus. That's what happens when Jesus takes the scroll. When they look to Jesus, the response was worship and adoration. When John was in that dark place and he was told, wait, Behold, look, the conquering lamb. When John looked, he was taken from that low place, that pit of despair, and he was taken to a high place, the throne room of worship.
Here's what's interesting. Notice in, in this scene, Jesus hadn't yet broken the seals. He just showed up. See, you could still be in that dark place. The seals hadn't been broken. The scroll had not been opened. Jesus hadn't conquered through tribulation and coming back yet to the earth. Yet they were proclaiming his excellencies and saying that he was worthy. And John was taken from that dark place to the, to the high place because Jesus showed up and his focus was on Jesus. See, I think that we can be in those tough times and, and we can be in the midst of that difficult time and we can still praise God. We can still praise God because he is worthy. Because what he has done in the past gives us faith and hope for the future. Because if he said it, he's going to do it. I love that. Uh, okay, now you guys are all amen. All right. <laughs> Way to go. Good. I love when Jesus is talking about heaven. And he's like, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I wasn't going to do it, I wouldn't tell you. And so Jesus is a man of his word. If he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And because of what he has done, we can have hope and we can have faith for the future when we look to Jesus. No matter what earthly circumstance that we are going through, heaven's reality is greater and it is better. And if this life here on earth ends, we have a better life. And so that gives us hope. And then we can enter into the throne room. And we can say, God, you're good. Jesus, you are worthy. You deserve all the glory. Jesus is where you find true joy. There's nothing in this world that can bring a satisfied, sustained joy. There's things that make you happy. There's things that are fun. But everything on this earth comes to an end. It's temporal. Jesus is eternal. The things of heaven are eternal. His kingdom are eternal. And those are the only thing that fills that hole in your soul that you have. And maybe you've tried different things in this earth to fill that hole. There's all kinds of things you could throw in there. But you know it doesn't last. It's only momentary. The only thing that can fill that is Jesus. And when he fills that, it is filled and you are sustained and you can enter the throne room and you can praise and give him glory. What Jesus did on the cross, he says here, his blood that he shed was so that you could be a part of his kingdom. His sacrifice on the cross was so that you could have joy, that you could be in relationship with his heavenly father, your creator. And when we take communion, you know, we have these uh, juice and crackers, these little elements. We're looking at Jesus. That's what we're doing. We're looking at Jesus. And so maybe whatever season you're in, I don't know, you know, it could be a great season. It's awesome. Praise God. It could be a really difficult season right now. You can still praise God to look to Jesus. And so we take that juice in the cracker and we consider his blood. We consider his body. These are elements. These, are, these aren't the real blood and body of Jesus. These are representations of them. They're, we get this from the book of Luke, actually. I have this for the overhead. Luke 22, 19. This is Jesus at the Last Supper with his guys, and he had taken some bread. He says he had given thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. He says, Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup is what poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus was initiating a new covenant. It was a new agreement between God and man, no longer dependent on that old covenant, on man's performance, but the new covenant on what God did, his power. And this brings hope. 
It brings you into the throne room. So this is where I want to get. This is what I want to do. I'm hopefully I point you to Jesus. I feel like I feel like I'm one of the elders. I put my hand on your shoulder and say, "Stop weeping. Look, it's Jesus." No matter what happens in this world, look, it's Jesus. And so let's see that. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. We're going to enter into a time of worship, and then we're going to have communion available. Uh, there's communion elements all over the room. During the worship, we're going to have probably 20 minutes of worship time. During that time, you'll be invited to come and receive communion. We have people for prayer that will be staged uh, in the front of the left and right of the stage. But let's pray, and then we'll get in that time. So, God, we want to thank you. We want to declare that you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Every created thing which is in heaven on earth and under earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessings and honor. God, we want to give you blessings and honor for you are worthy. Lord, in this time, in this life that we live, there can be difficulties. You know it. You said, you told us, in this world you'll have trouble, but have courage, take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus, that's what you said. You have overcome. We believe that. Jesus, you don't disappoint. Thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. Lord, as we take time now to respond by praising you, giving you our praises, God, would you be honored by that? Would you be glorified by that? I pray for anyone here, God, that's in a difficult time, Lord. Maybe they feel like they're in the pit of despair. Lord, it's difficult to even get out of bed. God, I pray that they would look to you. Lord, as they turn their eyes to you, Lord, they would be delivered from that dark place and brought into the light. God, would you usher us into the throne room? Give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.